What I'd like to do is start by with just a short introduction, uh, mainly saying what we're doing now. Uh, some of us are wearing multiple hats, but just kind of a short run through so that you know who's up there, up here, rather than just reading through our bios, which you can do uh, online. So I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel specifically because this represents a lot of different players in the publishing industry and I think it's a very unique group of people to get to have a conversation with about publishing. So uh, I'm your moderator, Brooke Warner, and I have two imprints, uh, She Writes Press and Spark Press, and we are hybrid imprints. And so uh, in the non-traditional space, but I also have 13 years in traditional publishing. So we're going to talk about all kinds of publishing, uh, including influencers and marketing and circuitous routes to publishing. Uh, so I think if we could go down the road here and then I'll ask some questions. Okay, well, I've, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> so I, uh, my pen name is Jane Allen as an author. My name is Janique Seeley and that's the name I've gone by professionally for <laughs> my career. Outside of writing and outside of being an author, I started as an attorney in the music industry and uh, and then moved over into marketing and uh, started a few companies. I worked on Lady Gaga's team, I worked for Prince, and then uh, launched a few other businesses, but have been heavily focused in marketing. And so I'm now completely focused in the publishing industry aside from being an author. I run marketing for a new imprint uh, called Zibby Books and I work with Zibby Owens. Should I leave it here? Bring it up. Okay, bring it up. Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Engel. I have over 20 years of, I know it should only look like 10, but I have over 20 years of publishing experience, um, mostly in the traditional space. I, uh, I've worked at Chronicle Books, 10 Speed Press, um, Publishers Group West. Uh, if some of you know uh, Charlie Witten from Berkeley, that's where I first started. Um, and then I launched my own imprint called the Collective Book Studio, now going into year four. Um, I never expected a pandemic because I run, uh, we are a lifestyle, nonfiction, and children's space. And it, what I call a partnership publishing house. Um, and so some of you who are familiar with publishing, and I worked on that at Chronicle Books, uh, the custom side, and 10 Speed Press, the custom side of publishing. I've kind of, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's what my company does, kind of break it out and really call a spade a spade and packagers and bring it to the trade. So I'm Angela and I'm really excited. I have no idea what Brooke is gonna ask us, but I'm ready. <laughs> I'm Tracy Thomas. I'm the host of a book podcast called The Stacks. Um, that's it for me. Uh, <laughs> keep it brief. Um, hi, I'm John Freeman. Uh, I'm an editor at Knopf, um, which is a large publishing company. Published everything from Langston Hughes to Toni Morrison to um, lots of other wonderful writers. Tony o Tommy Orange, who was here a couple years ago, was there. There, uh, I came into publishing um, as an editorial assistant, but also worked uh, for about ten or fifteen years as a book critic. I was involved in the National Book Critic Circle, um, and uh, for a while edited the. Literary Quarterly Granta magazine out of Britain, and um, was so enjoying losing someone else's money that I started my own literary magazine <laughs> called Freeman's, uh, and have had some experience uh, launching LitHub, um, uh, which is an online website about books, uh, and moved from there to, to Knopf during the pandemic, which is really interesting to start a job with lots of colleagues that you never see. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really nice to be here and to be talking to Brooke and everyone. Well, the panel is called Who Calls the Shots? And I think what's interesting about all of us up here is that we have some tendrils into the traditional space, some of us more than others. Um, and we're all wearing kind of multiple hats within the industry or different kinds of hats, you know? And so I think that's where I really would like to start. Um, and I have sort of specific questions for each of you that we might run down and then some questions for all of you. And so, uh, John, I think we could start with you. I mean, just in the sense that you currently actually have quite a traditional job, right? I mean, it is a big house. Um, and 
as the write-up says, you know, publishing is notoriously resistant to change. Uh, and so I would love for you to talk about why go back to traditional publishing after your career of dabbling around in, I mean, you were at Granta for a while, but then Lit Hub and all these other places. What do you hope to achieve and do you want to create change at the top in the big five or big four? Yeah, I think the change comes, um, there's a couple things, that, ways that change happens. Obviously, employment is not something I have control over at, at Knopf, but I can choose books that I love, and hopefully those books can be uh, beautiful and um, uh, radical and can create interior spaces that um, make exterior spaces more possible. Uh, so Nadifa Muhammad, is, who's here, uh, it was a... Booker finalist for her novel, The Fortune Men, was one of my first buys at, at Knopf. And um, she had been she had two books published in the US, um, and uh, I was able to get her third, this book, um, which is set in Wales, and it's about the last man to get uh, the death penalty in Cardiff. Um, he's a Somali sailor, fingered for a crime he didn't commit. Um, so it, when the book came out, it was very similar to um, a lot of the news stories that we're watching and reading. and the, Many of us have ha had had happened to people we know around us, but it was in um, it was in Wales, um, and it was a challenge to get a book like that through. To be honest, even though Nadifa is a multiply awarded, talented young writer, and I thought this book was an obvious mm -hmm. um, uh, contender for the Booker Prize, but because it was set in Wales, because it was written by a, a, a Muslim Somali woman um, who doesn't necessarily ring all the typical bells of a British writer, it was a challenge. And one of the biggest things I think I'm there to do, or I hope I'm there to do, is to challenge some of the lanes and the formats to thinking about what change looks like when it comes to publishing um, literature. And so the, the books I'm buying um, uh, are not necessarily obvious to some degree in, the, in, in what, they're, what they're opening up. Um, and to me, that's where really exciting things can happen, because who knew, you know, a couple of years ago, we would all be reading a 3,000-word memoir, which is called a novel by a Norwegian guy about why he's so angry at his dad. And, but like, or, or Ferranti, you know, for that matter. Really. Not all reading. <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. Um, so, Tracy, uh, I want to, I mean, beforehand you were kind of saying, I, I think I'm the one with the least experience here, and yet... Uh, for sure. You're an influencer, in fact, like such an influencer that I know that you like snacks, and I brought you a <gasps> present. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank so you. So when you're at. <laughs> I'll just do this, and then you guys do your thing, and I'll just. Yeah, snack. she'll be <laughs> snacking. But the reason I know that is because you have a very popular podcast, and you, in fact, are an influencer, and people know you, and they read books because you bring guests onto your podcast. So. I'd love for you just to talk about that space. And, and I think what I'm most curious about is sort of the blowing up part, you know, is, mm -hmm. is you got into it, I'm guessing, for the love of reading, mm -hmm. and it's really gotten big. So mm -hmm. do you see how you have influence and, you know, what has that trajectory been? Yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, this is what I call a pescatarian. It's a goldfish and a Swedish fish, and it's my favorite snack. You eat them together. So you're welcome in advance. Um, yeah, I mean, I started the podcast because I like books. I love books. I wanted to read books and talk about books. Um, I started the show in 2018. As far as, like, the growth of the show... I think some of it, a lot of it, has to do with what happened in the summer of 2020. Um, there was a lot of people who discovered racism for the first time. And I say that sort of jokingly, but also you would be insanely shocked by the DMs that I still get about questions about racism. But, you know, and I think what happened was that a lot of other book influencers, specifically white women, had not done any coverage of books by black authors specifically, but also authors from other racial and ethnic groups, people of the global majority. And so instead of doing that work, they just sent people to me. And so I got an influx of 
readers who all of a sudden wanted to read someone like Ibram X. Kendi, who I had had on the show in 2019, which I'm sure for most of you was before you'd ever heard of him, even though he had won the National Book Award. Um, you know, the week that this all happened, I had Bakari Sellers on the show. I had, you know, had Britt Bennett lined up long before. And so it was sort of this moment of you know, I mean, you all remember, it was this moment of like, how can I do the work? What do I need to do that aligned perfectly with the work that I was already doing? Which, you know, not that this is part of the conversation, but, you know, led to a lot of guilt for me of like, how come I'm finding success on, off of the deaths of my people? But also, you know, I have been doing the work and I had 100 plus episodes already at that point, about 75% of which featured a black author or an author of color. So I think, you know, the truth of how the show got popular is a little bit less sexy than I worked really hard and people find me charming and was a little bit more of like white guilt is a very powerful marketing tool, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the growth story of my show. Congratulations, it's great. And we'll, we'll circle back around to the ways that, um, yeah, that outside forces are influencing publishing and this that does go in, I mean, Tracy might not say she's calling the shots, but people like her are really creating new readers, uh, you know, of people who maybe otherwise wouldn't find certain writers. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, so Angela, I want to ask you just about being a disruptor in the publishing space. Uh, so Angela can talk more about her publishing model, which is partnership and the beautiful books that she does. And I hope that you'll all go visit her booth uh, down in the booth area. She can tell you which number that is. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you come out of traditional publishing, long time in traditional publishing. We go back 20 years um, and work together early, early on. Um, so why is it important to have non-traditional publishing models in the broader ecosystem of book publishing? Ooh, that's a great question. Okay, I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna answer your question, and but I do want to really say I actually put the stacks pod. I, I messaged you in 2020 because being an insider of over 20 years, I had the gift of having access. Right, so. This is going to answer Brooke's question, but why I actually listened to the Stacks Pod and put it on an, a blog I wrote in 2020. I'm from Minneapolis. I went to South High. Um, it was a really scary time. So I actually raised, thank you if anyone's in the audience, who helped uh, a lot of money for face shields for Abbott, the hospital there in South Minneapolis. And I actually was so compelled that I wrote on my blog, and I actually put the Stacks Pod as one uh, podcast to listen to. Um, and so this is sort of what I'm going to talk about, why I've been called a disruptor. It's because I feel my role, and I think, you know, I obviously launched my input before George Floyd was murdered, but... I feel my role of having access in a, a 20 years where I was able to see the New, the, uh, on the New York Times, Noam Chomsky's 9-11 and beyond that marketing when 9-11 hit. And I was able to do the four agreements and Amber Allen, and this is an independent publisher out of San Rafael, uh, Power of Now, New World Library. I had like this joy, right, where Cold Mountain, I was selling these books that really moved people in independent publishing and made the New York Times. And then I moved to 10 Speed Press, uh, What Colors Your Parachute, I got it back into Target, and then I finally went to Chronicle Books in San Francisco. And um, I loved it. And at that time, like the, over what, 11 years ago, um, I mean, independent publishing and independent bookstores, there were just more of us and there was access for us to get onto these lists. And at the same time, there was two monoliths happening. There was Amazon um, and there was the big houses. And so what I was noticing is that a lot of the independent presses, unfortunately, were getting bought up or no longer existing. And these independent presses like Manic D and Milkweed Editions, I mean, you could name it Candle Week. I know so many. I, that are left, um, but so many of those others, I think of Children's Book Press in San Francisco, were no longer able to make it, or they were bought up. And so what happened to a lot of authors is they were shut out again. 
and there's something called self-publishing that I noticed BIPOC authors were really, it was like a boom. So I said to my colleagues from Weldon Owen and 10 Speed Press and Chronicle Books, let's form a collective, let's think about it differently. So that's how Publishers Weekly has called me a disruptor and my team because what we do is we tell authors, you don't have to wait. How do we build budgets together? How do we crowdsource? How do we kickstart? How do we create um, the book you want to? And how do you make more royalties in that process? So that's what I do, and I'm pretty passionate about it. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Um, all right, so Jane, um, I'm, we agreed in advance that we would call her by her pen name so that you all can go okay. buy her, remember her name and buy her books afterwards, run to the park to get them. Uh, but Jane, you have a really interesting story too. Um, you self-published and then that led to a much bigger multi-book deal with a traditional house and then you also have a full-time job as a marketing person. So like a lot of us, you know, wearing kind of multiple hats and being, and having your fingers in a lot of different parts of the industry. And so I wanted to ask you about, I mean, it, it's interesting too to go down the line. I mean, we have different experiences. Angela comes from sales, John's coming from editorial. I want to say Tracy's coming from being an avid reader um, and you're coming from being an author and a marketing person. So. Um, can you speak to the marketing side a little bit and just how it connected to who calls the shots? Like, mm -hmm. how does marketing fit into that? Well, and from just to start that, from a marketing perspective, and I'll say this from a personal perspective, to me, who calls the shots is the reader. Mm -hmm. Both the person reading the books, both the, per the person sitting on the sidelines who would otherwise be a reader, but who isn't finding what they want on the shelves or doesn't have an access point to know about it. Uh, who material hasn't been written for yet, um, and the person who's a, a passionate about books, who reads and tells all of their friends. Uh, so to me, that's who calls the shots, and I'm always thinking about them. Uh, and that started from my career in the music industry. So just a bit about my story, which has been kind of unique as an author, um, I came from the marketing space, building brands for artists, for products, <laughs> for companies, and that has been my, my professional career. And I've always had a, a job, and that's what I'm, I'm passionate about doing that. I'm passionate about people and building audiences around things that I think deserve audiences. And when I decided that I had a project that I wanted to shepherd, which was my Black Girls Must Die Exhausted book as Jean Allen, um, I wrote a manuscript that I was proud of, that I thought was representative, that had a black female protagonist that I didn't see often in fiction, that I thought was an important perspective and voice that needed to be heard, and that was gonna pull people off of the sidelines as readers who had been um, sort of ignored. And I, I sent the manuscript to gatekeepers, to agents. The feedback I received was, we don't like her, <laughs> we don't find her relatable, uh, we don't find this the story of this book relatable, in short, it's not publishable, not passionate about it. And to me, uh, if I was did not have the, the uh, career that I had and the know-how and the knowledge that I had, I think I, if I was just an author that kind of didn't have that background, I would have been completely discouraged and that manuscript would have gone to the bottom of the drawer. But because I had the wherewithal and I knew what I knew about building audiences and I believed what I believed about the, the market, um, I put it out myself, and I amassed the resources, I put my own budget together, I did all of the things that a traditional publisher would do, put it out to find its audience. So, um, so that experience in and of itself showed me that there is an opportunity space for underrepresented voices. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so again, yeah. it was the audience for that book that called the shots. Uh, fast forward to 2020, <laughs> in the George Floyd era, the market for my book started to completely diversify. It started with a core group of black women um, readers who, seeing a book that represented them, they were passionate, they told 10 friends. <laughs> you know, They read the book, they came off the sidelines. They said, this is a book, I haven't read or finished a book in so long, and finally this brought me back to reading. That was one of the most important things to hear. And then uh, I wound up with a four book deal with Harper Perennial, and they, 
amplified the project. So again, with the gatekeeper saying, this isn't publishable, this isn't relatable, it wound up being a Target book club club pick. It has a television show in development. It was on Good Morning America. It was in the New York Times. <laughs> you know, so they're, they were wrong. And <laughs> no, I mean, but I say that yeah. to say that we have a gatekeeper industry. Now I say that we because I've come as an outsider into the doors. We have a gatekeeper industry and we have people that maybe are not internalizing the actual realities of the audience and what the audience is prepared for and maybe aren't um, empowering the people who I think of as the authors with perspectives that are underrepresented to go out and pull those people off the sidelines and to empower them to tell 10 friends about something that represents uh, something that's been un underrepresented, something that they can be passionate about. Um, so that's that's how I view it, and that's why I'm in this space, and that's the change that I hope to help facilitate. I love that. It was so inspiring. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, John, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, it's an interesting just kind of cycle here to go back to the work that you're doing at Knopf, but when you had, I read something that when you had Freeman's, you were, showcasing like very well-known authors, people like Louis Sirdrick and um, Murakami, but then you would sort of do that to slide in unknown people as well, right? Which I think is another really important way that editors, because I'm also formerly an editor in the traditional space, you know, have always worked to find ways to make sure that underrepresented voices are heard and published, and so, I'd love for you just to speak about that because it does seem like it's been a cornerstone of your work. Yeah, it's the most fun thing to do as an editor is to introduce a new writer because they no one knows what they sound like, no one has heard them before, and it's like um, you know uh, when you read someone for the first time that you fall in love with, you always remember that that moment, you know whether it's one of your books or if it's uh, you know one of your own favorites and. Um, as a literary magazine editor, you have the benefit of like this kind of music festival traveling in one between two covers, and so you have some names that might be recognizable, Marlon James or someone, you know. Um, but then you have these other people that are brand new to everyone who's reading the issue, unless it's that person's mother. Um, and so the first issue of Freeman's had, you're right, Louise Erdrich and um, Haruki Murakami and. Dave Eggers, um, but it also had Fatina Bass, who's a um, writer who lives in Berlin now, um, who had not published anywhere. Um, and the longest piece in the issue was by her, because I thought it was fantastic. It was this incredible piece of a novel that she's writing. Um, and that's just, uh, to me, that's good publishing. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, I'm sure you all feel this way. We're all living in this strange, distorted reality in which um, algorithms are, t are showing us news and they're showing us things because you clicked on it once, it shows you more of what you th it thinks you like. And so I'm just currently surfing through the weirdest of my Instagram where it's like I've liked one Volkswagen van and now it's showing me Volkswagen vans with muscle guys, with tall guys, with like dogs with three legs because I've clicked on one of those images once. And I think in, in publishing and in capitalism right now, we're, we've entered into a looking glass where people are starting to think algorithmically about everything, about culture. And so it's like if something doesn't exist, therefore it can't possibly exist because who would like it? Meanwhile, it's like if a cover works, everyone designs a book to look that way. Um, and uh, I, I think that's just hugely cognitively distorting and screwed up. And, so I, I think hopefully that everyone here is a disruptor in their own way because we have to break out of those cycles to come upon new ideas and information and storytellers. Uh, otherwise, we're just gonna get more of what, it's like if you like this, you're gonna like this. And hopefully what's provocative and enduring about a podcast like yours is it's deeply subjective <laughs> and it's yours. And it, it, you, know, you might have you know, Ibram Kendi there, but you might have someone that's completely unexpected because it, it comes from, the Im unpredictableness, which is you. Mm -hmm. Great segue, because Tracy, I wanted to ask you about discoverability. I mean, I think a lot of people who are doing podcasts, like you're discovering, you're, you're a person who is like on the forefront of discoverability for a lot of your listeners. And on the other hand, you kind of have to have 
big names on the show in order to grow an audience? Um, I mean, you talked about the organic growth and all that stuff, but how do you balance that? I mean, it's sort of a similar question because in anthologies, for instance, mm -hmm. people, anyone who has ever tried to put together an anthology will know that the industry is like, well, you have to have big names. You know, so how do you even think about that in terms of the kind of guests that you bring on and, and just what you read in general? Um, yeah. So <laughs> my podcast is independent and I don't know if a lot of you know what that means, but basically I don't, my podcast is not produced by Spotify or Apple or Stitcher or any of those things. So I'm in charge of everything that I do. I was on a network for a short period of time and there was a little bit of pressure to have big names, but you know, the truth of my show and the truth of me as I'm, my mom's here, happy Mother's Day. I'm very stubborn, I like what I like. And I put a lot, I'm a very hard worker and I will put everything that I have into what I do, but I simply will not spend the time that it takes to read a book that I'm not interested in just because potentially I could speak to Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> not that I had that opportunity, but I don't know that I would say yes to that. So. And, and I have been able, I did have, you know, I've had some really big celebrities on the show. I had Quentin Tarantino on and he's one of my favorite directors. So that was like a no brainer yes for me. It was not a, should I do it because I don't like him? Um, and that goes for the most famous people I've had on the show, but that also goes for the people that no one knew or I didn't even know. You know, I get sent tons of emails from marketing and PR teams saying, have this author on, have this author on. And the ultimate question for me has always been, am I curious enough about this person or this book to spend the six, eight, 10, 12 hours reading the book, listening to their interviews, coming up with questions? And if the answer is no, I just, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but as far as programming, how I put it together, yes. Like the month that I had Quentin Tarantino on, I think that I had, you know, I think it was like Quentin Tarantino, Ashley C. Ford, Clint Smith, um, and the book club pick, I can't remember, but it, you know, I, I try to pair everything up and, and mix it up so that it's not always, you know, it's not going to be Quentin Tarantino, Angelina Jolie, Jesus and Mero back to back, <laughs> but it's going to be Angela Chen talking about asexuality followed by Jesus and Mero. You know, like I'm, I do try to mix it up as far as what the audience is hearing, but I don't succumb to the pressure of like, you need to read this celebrity memoir. Yay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Wait, I don't want to say about celebrity memoirs. I actually really love them, especially on audiobook. I just, well, I actually love a celebrity memoir. I don't, it's not to be like, you know, I, I'm yes, not shitting on them at all. No, totally. And they're not the only kinds of memoirs out there that are amazing. No. That's, that's important. So, yes. Uh, so, Angela, I'd love, you know, I think people are coming out to hear, at least you're here, I think, because you're interested in publishing to some extent. So, I'm kind of curious about a compare and contrast, you know, like what would you say is the very best and the very worst difference, you know, in terms of the kind of publishing model or the experience that you're in versus, you know, as compared to traditional publishing. So the best and the worst thing. Oof. After the, what, was it that huge statement last week that you <laughs> wrote on Jade Friedman's blog about predatory publishing? Listen, um, I've been like jotting notes because I love to do this. Um, I'm a comparative literature major. And the book that changed, and I've never written a book, and I think it's the hardest thing of people who've written books, and I've never been an editor. I've always been in marketing, sales, and business development, and now a founder and a publisher, meaning I run a business and a lot of business development there. Um, but books, I do honestly, I have this hashtag I started using a while ago that was called, and it was a mantra I say to myself, which is change starts with you. I would just like, I run, I love to run, and in my head I'm always like change starts with you, change, like when I'm having a day. And, um, you know, for me, I came up with that because when I read Alberto Manguel, he's an Argentinian writer, and when I was in college about the history of reading, that's where I got it. I got that I, my change, my becoming better as a human being has always come from books. And so naturally in my mid forties, I'm a publisher because I still believe that. I think we're all touching on it. John has kind of touched on, on it of what, you know, our favorite authors are. 
So the goodness, I guess I'm starting there, Brooke, is really truly that I uh, feel pretty strongly on that I, I think that readers, I think that books really do change lives. So I am blessed to have the role I have now. And I expect, I mean, I get pinged all the time. There's no angel, there's no VC. Um, and because I feel like in 20 years, I can't wait to see what my community is. Maybe I'll be in Hawaii with them, but I want to own it. I want to be a women owned press, right? Like those things are important to me um, because there's nobody asking me, telling me what I have to publish in the world. Um, the worst of it, <laughs> how much money it costs. Um, it is no joke. To get, I make extremely beautiful books. I think they are offset. They're, you know, most are printing. Um, we real, we do a lot of spot gloss and cling. I mean, I had a book, uh, one of our books we published called Fifty Two Shabbats. It was in the New York Times and Washington Post. Imagine this, an independent, women-owned press. Our first debut cookbook got first in the LA Times, then the Washington Post, and then in the New York Times. We sold out of six thousand units within three weeks. Um, that was the biggest blessing of my life. Uh, we went back to press for another 10, but no one really knows. The audience doesn't know a woman-owned press is publishing that, right? Because it looks just as good as Crown, if not better, uh, than Clarkson Potter. But what the point is, is that that audience told us that they wanted that book, right? And yet how expensive it is, right, to float that and do that, I think is a challenge, and yet I'm so excited because my model, that's why I believe in my model so hardly, is that I ask of the authors, like, how are we going to look at this budget together? Um, and so how are we going to fund the project together? And I, what I've noticed is more and more authors are interested in my model because um, they get benefit from more royalties, but they also benefit from utilizing the content in other ways, in merchandising, in other things that I've noticed um, because we have to change. I mean, I think traditional publishing has to change. Yeah, and, and there's that, that partnership aspect that is super exciting for people who have that energy. So yeah. um, I, I want to ask, you know, the reason I'm asking like the best and the worst and the hard and the good is because that's what publishing is. You know, I mean, there's a lot of discouragement. You spoke to feeling discouraged and doing it anyway, which a lot of people don't have the wherewithal to do that. Um, but another thing that's discouraging is just once you have a book that's out there, finding a readership, you know, continuing to keep going. And so I'm pointing back to your two hats, you know, as marketing and author, uh, marketing expert and author, what is, what are things that work? You know, what works in this new environment? Well, I, th I think one of the lessons, the takeaways for me in this experience, which I learned something new every day and, um, and couldn't love it more in a sense. And it also drives me crazy, <laughs> but, but, uh, but really this has been an exercise of passion and perspective and, uh, perspective being very, very important that having a vision for something that I really wanted to put forward into the world and to build an audience around and then having the passion to see it through. And I think that it's a bit of a new model in the space for publishing because typically it would be driven a different way. It would be that you as an author write something that, you know, and then somebody is your advocate and shepherd and they, from the gatekeeper community. And typically, as John was kind of saying, it's done in arrears. Like, oh, that worked, that worked. Okay, this matches. Yes, I can, I think that this can sell because it's, you know, and, and then there's, visionaries who will pick something up and say, this should be in the world and I'm gonna champion this. So there's different avenues, but I'd say that's 5%, <laughs> you know, maybe 10% and 90% is kind of this match, match up. You know, I've, this has worked in the past and, and the music industry worked like that as well. So it's not uncommon. Um, so the, the opportunity space now is not to lead from matching uh, what has happened, but kind of listening in the space of 
where's the audience? What's missing? What do people want to hear? Where's, where's the passion and the perspectives and where do those two things align? And how can we bring forth projects where passion and perspective are in alignment? And how do we champion those authors who not just have the perspective that um, that has a passion associated with it, whether it's their own passion that they're championing their work or that it corresponds to an audience segment that's going to be passionate and champion that work. How do we find those people, give them the resources to be a shepherd of their work? So whether it's matching up a marketing tool set with an author, which they wouldn't have any necessarily reason to have, but then empowering those authors to do that. And that's what we do at Zibby Books, and that was something that was very, very important. And I think as an author myself, I'm like, yes, you know, teach us how to do this, to use social media platforms, to build your, to launch your own podcast, to build your audience, to nurture your audience, to be able to, to host a community and be a center point with your perspective and build that community and nurture that and grow that community. That's really, really mm -hmm. important in this space. And I think it's a deviation from what the expectation has traditionally been uh, for authors. And so it is pulling double duty and it is a new skill set and it is difficult. But so I think that, that you know, thinking of these things differently um, and also with the, the influencer space, just being that, that voice, um, bringing more people into uh, reading and being not, not a gatekeeper, but being a curator. <laughs> we need all of those things. And so I think we're watching this industry shift in a very, very exciting way. Um, and I just hope to continue to be a support resource to help that continue to happen. Can I, can I say something about this? Um, because I, I've heard both of you say, you know, it's like about the reader, it's about the reader, and I am a reader. Like I really, I'm not in publishing, which I cannot stress to you all enough. I don't know who calls the shots. I'm hoping to figure this out as well. Um, but I think from what I've seen and from my experiences as, you know, sort of, I joke, a professional reader, mm -hmm. is that so often, the gatekeeping is happening even when I go as a professional reader with an established podcast and say, I'd like to feature this author, and I'm ignored or told no. Mm -hmm. And on the flip of that, there's so many people asking authors to do their own marketing. And I have to be honest, a lot of authors can't do that. They don't know how. You can give them a kit, and no offense, I love an author. They're writers. Mm -hmm. Some of, them, some of them are great. I'm sure you've heard them on NPR. Like some of them are great and they do all this stuff fantastic, but it's not enough and it's yeah. not fair to the authors to ask them to do that work because that's not their skill set, you know? And so for me, what I see a lot is though, even though, you know, if a book sells a lot, of course the readers are calling the shots, but so often for me, the marketing and the PR teams are gatekeeping, as you mentioned, and pushing it off on the authors and then sort of blaming the authors or blaming social media for the book not having picked up. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's very frustrating. I cannot tell you all the number of times I have been told no or been completely ignored or let me circle back with you. And, and especially, as I mentioned, you know, my show features a lot of authors of color, black authors specifically, and that's what I'm reaching out about. I'm not reaching out about Stephen King. You know, like, I, it's just not, I don't read it, I'm not interested, and he doesn't need it, frankly. So to be told no, or to be ignored, right. or to, you know, have to find out that one of my favorite authors who I think is phenomenal is being asked to DM bookstagrammers <laughs> in order for them to hopefully feature their book, like, I don't think that that is valuing the author or the reader. I think that that becomes a really yucky exchange, and that's just been my experience. I Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> in the, in the, I think that's a traditional. That that is unfortunately a hallmark of the traditional, traditional. space. Yeah, we'll talk and about. when I was doing things independently, and I my book happened to launch kind of at the very beginning of Bookstagram. This was like 2018 when I did it on my own. And a lot of the Bookstagrammers that I talked to, because I did a lot myself, my outreach, and then I had a publicist who helped me, who I paid. I had, I had to pay out of pocket for these right. services, yes. but yes. I did this. She helped tremendously. And, but a lot of the Bookstagrammers that we reached out to said, wow, you're one of the first authors that would ever talk to me or would ever show, show up on my Bookstagram or would do an interview. I never get approved for ARCs. Nobody oh ever d agrees to do interviews. I can't believe you did. You were one of the first people that did my podcast or did an Instagram live with me. And I'm like, 
really? I'm shocked that you wouldn't talk to me. Like, of course I would do this. You know, but, um, but, that, but I had a different way of thinking about marketing. But I also heard independent bookstores say to me, um, you know, when I did my first tour, again, when I was still independent, um, that they had a lot of trouble with the large publishers mm -hmm. getting black authors that were high profile into their stores and when I uh, to book them they won't they wouldn't do the schedule the event and there's a cost associated with that because right. the, the publishers got to move the author from wherever they're situated they, they've got to fly them lodge them transport them so there is a cost for every um, every stop and there's choices that have to be made and a lot of times people do wind up on the other side of the negative right. side of those choices. So th there's a reality to that that also needs to change perception wise and otherwise. Um, but I think part of it is empowering, we're in a transition space. So I think it's both being acknowledging the, the role of influencers, independent bookstores, having ultimate reverence for that and those, those uh, people that operate and considering them part of this ecosystem and then also empowering authors to build those skill sets where we all understand how important each of these different pieces that operate in this industry, um, how important they are and how they work together. So I think it's a transition space, but. Well, hold on, let me just frame something yeah, for yeah. you and John to both answer and then we'll move to Q&A. Um, just because, no, I think this is an interesting topic that's been yeah. brought up and um, you know what, really what Tracy's talking about I think are like these systems, you know, that yeah. benefit certain kinds of authors with certain kinds of personalities, mm -hmm. you know, and then you have the publishing industry trying to like say, well, we're, we want these certain things. And the reason that happens is, I mean, for those of us in the traditional space, there's a hierarchy, right? I mean, mm -hmm. their books are listed as like A, B, C, right? Mm -hmm. The A's get everything, the C's get very little. And so that's all behind the scenes, you know? And so I'd be curious to hear the thoughts from the two of you, you know, as working for a big publisher, owning your own publishing company, just to respond to it from that, sentiment, you know, if we have a system that still benefits certain kinds of authors, and it absolutely is still a gatekeeping model. That, I mean, I don't think that really can change completely, but there are barriers, you know, that we're certainly breaking down in the non-traditional spaces. Do you want me to start there? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so I admit, I'm from sales, marketing, and business development. We, as, you, as an editor, you would know, are huge gatekeepers. Huge. I mean, you know, how many books would come out from a desk? And you kind of talk about this, Brooke, too, being an acquiring editor. Uh, you got to go to your sales and marketing and business development team. You just do, we want your comp titles, what's the platform, what's the bio uh, nowadays. But what, I mean, there was a great piece in the New York Times, I think, last year about um, Instagram following and how, what the big houses are now noticing. It doesn't necessarily mean it sells books. Um, you know, I'm gonna, what, what Tracy was saying has a lot to do with the traditional space and why I've been called a disruptor at pub, and I'm, I'm proud of it. Like I was called it a few years ago uh, by Publishers Weekly, and I remember Elizabeth Saki, she's my acquisitions editor, and we met at Chronicle Books. She's like, are you okay with this term that you're called? I'm like, I love that term. Call me a disruptor any day. Um, and the reason is this. I'm just calling a spade a spade. An advance is, uh, is not real money. It's a borrowed amount of money. So you work really hard for three years, and then it comes out of your royalties. In that advance, often, you have a lot to pay for. Mm -hmm. You have a publicist. You have all your marketing. You have to do all that work. And that's not really told to you. You have to build your website, your platform, everything. So I'm talking about it. Because I've, I've been there, right? And I'm saying, what if? And I think I come from this because I saw the screaming symphony behind me of self-published authors that some of it is not, should not, honestly, I have, I'm really harsh. Probably should not be writing a book. But some of it is really good. And so I saw this kind of scream from like what I, over 20 years ago, Amazon really was a bookseller with Walden Pond in the mall. And so now Amazon is this monolith and has also been able to kind of capitalize in so many ways on people. Because that model doesn't have 
sort of the network and the outreach and the professionals. And so I think for me, I mean, backing up is that just calling a spade a spade and training authors, talking to authors, talking about how royalties can, talking about intellectual property. I mean, some of these contract things, I'm, I'm all game, Brooke. I, I know game. you are. <laughs> I love it. And there's a lot to discuss. So John, and I want to move to audience. Uh, so John, do you want to cap this conversation with anything from your experience? Um, America is an incredibly unequal country. And yeah. so what you see around you in the country is mirrored in its industries. And so 90% of the money the publishers have are spent on less than fewer than 10% of the books. And as an editor, you're fighting against that system. And that's the, that's the big corporate system. So, um, I've, the, I've bought books for a huge range of money from uh, upwards of seven figures and downwards to, to, to four. Um, and uh, the, 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 ch the difference between what happens when you buy a book for seven figures between what you, when you buy one for $1,500, which I have because I publish poetry, is shocking. <laughs> Um, uh, and you get the whole system, um, you know, but the, uh, and so my, my hope is to try to fold into corporate publishing where I am, because they do this as well, Knopf um, has published so many different types of books, and it's not always the books that they think are going to succeed, which succeed. Right. Um, it's, it's just to, to keep trying to give as many writers as I believe deserve a shot, a shot. Um, and. So when Nadifa Muhammad's book was shortlisted for the Booker Prize as an editor, I had a brief window of freedom. <laughs> and so I bought a, a novel in verse by a Swedish Sami indigenous writer, uh, a 700 page book about a family migrating their reindeer across Lapland. And it told the story of the family from 1900s to the early 2000s. And it was like Louise Erdrich meets Anne Carson. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was my chance to get that book in. Um, but as you noticed, I, I was able to describe that book in 12 sec sentence, seconds. And you know, when you talk about Salesforce, like I cannot ask Knopf Salesforce to go heroic every single time. Like I can't ask them to go into bookstores and rejuvenate someone's career with every single sale. Like they, they, ha they have a lot of books to sell. And, so, and one of the things that I think um, you run into as an editor in publishing and, and anywhere is like what you're asking the sales force to do when they're getting booksellers to buy a book. Um, and so I, I do agree with what Jane was saying. Like you, you actually have to try to move around that system to some degree and create a demand or follow what demand is being built up outside. So one, one of the books I've signed up developed through that kind of interaction where I was on a, a panel for Penn, uh, which is a freedom of speech organization. And we had um, a, a group of mentees who have been chosen and who were coming and coming to New York City for a couple weeks and they were gonna work with writers and they were all writers of color. Um, and we were, and I was on the group, the panel with Ted Chang, who's a wonderful short story writer and Kimon Felix, who's a great poet. and. We were thinking about what to give them, and there was no book of craft writing for mm -hmm. black poets. Um, and Kimon and I had a moment uh, over Zoom, and we're like, that's a book, like mm -hmm. black poets on craft. And so I, afterwards, we emailed with each other, and we're like, we should put together this book. And I was like, well, who would you put in it? And we started going back and forth. And you know, I'm working at one of the big four, you know, and she's a poet who's been published by all small presses. Um, but we were able to come together with an idea, and we were like, we'll make this with another editor, and it will be a benefit for uh, Kave Kanam, which is a kind of foundation uh, which creates writing programs and workshops. And so I, I think the, the future of publishing doesn't entirely have to be held up by disruptors. Like, I, I've, I'm not here as a corporate shill, but I do think you can disrupt from within an industry oh, if you pay attention. And I also think you can have corporate level successes within small presses if you kind of leverage some of the things that you have going for you. Well, I think it's really important what you're saying, John, because I think, I mean, I, I was in traditional publishing for so many years and everyone I know has incredible 
it's a values-centered kind of job. Everybody wants to be publishing the best books, and but there are compromises that get made. And as you said, you kind of have money in the bank as an editor sometimes, and then you slip in that project that you really care about, but you obviously are paying attention to the bottom line. So it's it's complex, <laughs> um, and I think that is a is a good note to end on because we're not going to solve the publishing problems of the world on this panel today. Um, and we'd love to take audience questions for the last ten minutes. I'm going to help you. Oh sure. Hello, my name is Harry Williams in the writing community in the, in the streets of Oakland. I'm known as OG Rev, <laughs> and um, I've um, in the, the late 1990s. Uh, a writer named Sister Soldier created a book called The Coldest Winter Ever. And that book exploded and it opened up doors uh, of reading in the, in the inner city communities um, that, um, that, that changed, that revolutionized everything. But I began to realize um, something about that. It didn't open the doors for other writers of color who, who uh, were able to uh, speak to the inner city, the heart of inner city young people. F 50 Cent the Rapper, um, realized that there was a market for these kind of books. And so he took each of the leading um, urban fiction writers and he wrote books with them. Mm -hmm. And then later on, he went to the Stars Network and created the Power series. He created, uh, of, of the, he, uh, he created other series, um, a whole genre, a whole, um, he, he, took the, he took this capsule and he created this TV network that, that's transformed the world. Um, Snowfall became a huge hit because of urban fiction. What I began to realize because I'm an urban fiction writer is that um, there are people who are superstars within that genre, but they're almost always self-published. Mm. There, there, there are no, even though this, this genre of, is moving huge numbers, it's not been embraced by the mainstream publishing industry. And I, uh, so when I began to look into getting Oh, okay. Can we, they, yeah, just <laughs> oh, I'm so, <laughs> we'll bring so, a question so, or it's a statement, either way. No, it's a question. It's yeah. a, it really is a question. Why is that? And mm -hmm. why is the uh, publishing industry uh, kind of so closed off to people of color? And do you see any change for that? Let's have Jane tackle that one first. Well, just because it mirrors <laughs> some of the things that you were talking about. And then if other people want to, but I'd love to. I, I, I'm just going to be very candid. The publishing, traditional publishing industry is 95% white. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people, and, and it's a business, and there's a risk tolerance within traditional businesses. There, there, is a, there has to be a profit margin. People have repercussions to their jobs <laughs> if the company doesn't do well. So people have to make their decisions based on their assessment of the risk of something being very successful, making money, versus losing money for the company. If you, the world that you view looks like this, Okay, and looks a certain way, and you don't, and, and you, so I'm telling you what publishing looks like, so that's gonna be kind of what the world looks like to the people in that industry. You don't have a perception or even an understanding of the um, representation or the representative market that's outside of your, pur of your purview, of what you, of the world that you know and experience. And so you don't have the, you can't internalize that it's not as risky as you think because you don't have that exposure. So it's a tremendous market opportunity. If somebody's listening to this, they wanna make a lot of money, they should figure that out and go into publishing these books and, and make that money, amplify it and, and make it mainstream, just like rap was. I mean, And like you were saying, they were wrong. I mean, yeah, I actually and love <laughs> that statement because it's so true. There's this very myopic, and it's also true that acquisitions editor acquire what they know. Right, mm -hmm. right? or what they feel passionate. It's yeah. so subjective. And unfortunately, bias hides within the curtain folds of subjectivity. And it's something that needs to be challenged, and that's why it's important to be frank. And there also needs to be people who can champion. There's gotta be someone in the room that can champion it as passionately as you just championed it just now, okay? And that's why I try to be in the room. That's why I'm, I'm doing double duty as an author <laughs> and also working in publishing. It's important to have people in the room. So I think it's just as important to see the diversification within the author space as it is to see people inside the businesses yeah. that are in these roles and in the room that can be passionate advocates for the opportunities that haven't really been within the purview of the traditional landscape. If there's something short to add, because yeah. I want to make okay. sure we get at Sorry. least one. No, 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 just one <laughs> more just, author I just question. wanted Audience. to 
tell you the th the th the reality the the thing is is you're right it, you're totally right and i think disrupting whatever i feel it's really a duty cuz i have had access for over 20 years and there's no right answer here other than um, look, what happened after George Floyd was murdered, every single celebrity or musician who's never written a book now has a children's book, a politician, if they're black. Like, we have to re talk about what really happened in the room, even on the traditional side, mm -hmm. and then address how is that, how did that move the needle really for writers in the black community? It didn't, right? Because these politicians, or these, they all got the book deal. And so, yeah, I, I think this is a really key conversation, and I think you're right, Jane. It's putting people in in the room, and you know, I I have some thoughts on that that I can share <laughs> not today, but I I have some big thoughts about it about how visit Angela's booth for big thoughts. <laughs> big thoughts on it. Can I, can I just say yes, one of quick course. tiny tiny thing? I just I just want people to understand this. In 2013 or 14, The Atlantic did an article about who is the most likely person to own and buy books, and that is black college educated women. Publishing says that the reader moves the needle, but if that's the person who's most likely to buy a book, how come publishing is so white? Mm -hmm. How come publishing doesn't publish back books and it took the murder of multiple black people in the streets of America during a pandemic to even get the books published by these politicians? I just wanna be really clear with you, it's not a you thing. Publishing is very racist, point yeah. blank, period, the end. Well, and publishing pays so poorly, so essentially white parents are subsidizing their children to have these jobs a lot of times, and then there's microaggressions that cause black people to leave. You know, I mean, there's a lot of systemic stuff that we could have a whole panel on, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I have done panels on that, so yes, exactly, next year. Okay, let's try to get one more uh, audience question. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, this question is for Tracy. You were talking about um, reaching out to authors and getting no's, and I'm wondering where those no's are coming from. It's, I, I get yeses a lot from authors, I gotta be honest. If I reach out to an author, it's usually because I've been told no by the publisher. So <laughs> I deal a lot with the marketing teams and the publicity teams. So. It's very rare that I ever deal with an editor. It's very rare that I ever deal with a salesperson. I don't think I ever have. But I often will get a list of what's coming out and I'll say, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I want to read. I want to have so-and-so on the show. I'll reach out to the team and they'll tell me no. Hmm. So then, as I mentioned, I'm a pretty stubborn person. So I just slide right in those DMs and I go to the author and I say, hey, listen, I'd love to have you on the show. And I got to tell you about 90% of the time, it's a yes. Mm -hmm. When? Great. And sometimes I say, can you send an email and connect me with your publicity person? Because they do the like scheduling and I don't want to be a, a pest to the author who's like trying to promote their book. I'm like, someone is being paid to do this job for you, but it's usually the publishing team. And that goes across the board for big publishers and small publishers and independent presses. It's not only the big publishers. We have time for one more, so. Um, they're not letting you hold oh. the mic. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christina and I'm a book publicist. And my question is how can I best help to amplify voices that aren't being heard as much as they should within the publishing and the book world? Uh, what type of uh, book publicity? of a team, so we actually we work with all kinds of genres. We do we focus a lot on audi targeted audience research. Can I, can I yeah. jump in here? Uh, one is don't charge thirty five thousand dollars a month, yeah. which is what publicity <laughs> charges. Um, yeah. You know, I I am shocked yeah. at, at what because uh, I'm a poet too, and some of my colleagues hire freelance publicists, and it's like thirty forty grand a month. So a don't do that. Um, and B, you know, one of the things that I think that Tracy is running into is, is um, when you publish a book, if you're not, um, uh, you know, going to sell millions of copies, you have about a, a three to four week tops window mm -hmm. to have your book pr uh, promoted. It, it's yeah. coming up to when it's coming out, and then coming, and then when it's after. So, uh, as an editor, I'm I wrote to this festival to say you should invite Nadifa Muhammad because I knew. Her publicist had worked on, had moved on to new books because that's how they have to work. So if you're working with underrepresented authors, give them the entire year, and think about like all the time that, like what you can do four months after publication versus like the the three weeks when 
they're going to get all the support they need. Sorry. I know that's a great answer. And also, in I always say a nonfiction book that doesn't get old. A really good nonfiction book, right? So like a year. I mean, the, you have a time. It's that's the genre I go in. So I really don't talk about the novel genre, but like really for book publicists, come on, like they can get six months, seven, eight months down the road talking about some really interesting issues, especially in the nonfiction space. Give it up for this panel. What an incredible group. Thank you, everyone.